All right, great. Why don't we uh, go ahead and get started? So welcome back, everybody, to uh, EE240. Thanks to those of you guys who are here in uh, person. So any uh, last-minute questions before we kind of dive back into stuff? Or... Okay, I'm assuming things are still fairly fresh since that was only about four and a half hours ago that we kind of ended. So I'm just going to go ahead and dive back in. But again, if you have any questions, just you know, raise your hand or throw something at me or whatever. Okay, so where we basically ended up last time was talking about noise. Uh, specifically noise and circuits, of course. And what I started sort of explaining was that noise is really just coming about because essentially the electrons are moving around in a kind of semi-random way. And when they happen to cross by where you're sort of measuring a voltage or a current or whatever it is, you're going to see some fluctuation there. Okay. So again, the key point was that noise is really random. So you can't predict what the value of the voltage will be at any instantaneous time. All you can do is say, on average, what should the voltage be, meaning the mean, or how much variations around that average do you expect, like the variance, or perhaps even what the distribution of that voltage will be, or basically the dynamics of that voltage, meaning the frequency spectrum. Okay. So, at least initially, the the sort of the most dominant noise, and probably actually in most of the class, the most dominant type of noise we'll be looking at is so-called thermal noise. So again, this is really just coming about because of the random motion of electrons inside of whatever circuit it is that we're working with. Uh, another sort of sort of term that you may have heard is Johnson noise. Uh, it's all the same thing. This is all coming from the thermal motion of things. And again, the analogy of basically if I took just a bunch of little particles and put them inside of, let's say, a little beaker with water, and you just kind of watched what was happening over time, all right, you'd sort of see they're kind of randomly moving around inside of there. On the net, there's no real motion. Like, you know, on aggregate, nothing is really moving around. But each one of them is probably sort of randomly just being jostled around. And again, kind of the way to understand that is if there's any temperature, then the atoms inside of that water are kind of shaking around, and they're sort of moving those particles around. Right? That's really the source of this thermal noise. Now. There's a whole bunch of physics textbooks sort of written about you know, how you calculate that noise and actually even statistical mechanics textbooks about what the, you know, the power of that noise is and things like that. Long story short, from our standpoint, the sort of most important thing for you to know is that if the temperature goes up, you're going to get more noise. Right? And it kind of intuitively makes sense because the water molecules, or in our case, the atoms inside of our circuit are shaking around faster. And that tends to shake around the electrons or the particles also faster, okay? Or really, I should say, in a more, let's say, violent way, okay? So from now on, or, or kind of the key thing that you need to know is that the amount of noise power you have available to you is always Kb, which is Boltzmann's constant, times temperature, times the frequency range that you're looking at, okay? So that's the available noise power. And by the way, just so, sort of so clear, we'll actually use this a little bit later. This is a direct function of the, the noise energy, just being Kb times T. Okay? So the noise energy that's available is Kb times T. The power, therefore, is Kb times the frequency over which you're looking. Okay? Now, this is making a particular assumption about the white noise, which is that it's so-called white meaning that it's equally distributed over all frequencies. But you know, we'll talk about in a second sort of where that breaks. That's basically true for just about anything that we're going to be interested in. Okay? So again, what this is is the available amount of power that you can get from sort of thermal noise if you were to drive a so-called matched load. Okay? And I'll quantify what I mean by that in a second. But it's actually sort of useful to, to look at some numbers here. So if let's say that I was just looking over a 1 hertz bandwidth, then the amount of power you'd have available would be 4 times 10 to the minus 21 watts. Okay? Very small number, obviously. Uh, by the way, for those of you guys who like dBm, that's minus 174 dBm. But obviously, if you start scaling this up in terms of bandwidth, then very quickly, you get more noise than that. So just to make sure everyone's sort of paying attention, we said that with 1 hertz, we had 4 times 10 to the minus 21 watts. What would happen if I looked at a 1 megahertz bandwidth? How much noise would I get? Go ahead. 
Not too bad. Even logarithmic multiplies, so you know. <clears throat> How much noise am I going to get? 4 times 10 to the minus 15. Yeah, it's just 4 times 10 to the minus 15, right? In other words, a megahertz is 6 orders of magnitude larger than a hertz. So I have 6 orders of magnitude more noise. Okay? Make sense to everybody here? So, by the way, these are good numbers to remember because when somebody tells you, oh, I built an amplifier with, let's say, 10 gigahertz of bandwidth and, I don't know, I'll make up a number, let's say, 10, oh, that's not even it, 10 femtowatts of input referred noise, you could sort of look at them and say, mm hmm, that's a little bit weird because that doesn't sound, you know, I don't see how the, the KT is any lower than that, right? In fact, KT is, you know, like a couple orders of magnitude larger than that, so something sounds strange here, okay? So just keep some of these numbers in mind because, again, they'll be useful for sort of these back of the envelope types of calculations we're going to do later, okay? So, so far we've been kind of talking about noise in general. Now let's specifically look at how would we sort of model noise in a circuit that we might be interested in. Or really more specifically, let's figure out how we would come up with what the right model for noise is in kind of the simplest circuit we can imagine. So, or the, really the simplest element we can imagine is just going to be a resistor. Okay, and we'll walk through kind of a few different elements and see what the noise is going to be, but let's just start out with a resistor. Okay, so in general, the way I'm always going to model noise is I'm going to add some either voltage or current source that's kind of either in series or in parallel with the element that I'm talking about. So for here, let's just model it with a voltage source for now, and we'll see how we would do it with current in one second. Now, just to be really clear, when I drew this model over here, so what I'm really doing is I'm taking my resistor, and I'm adding this voltage source over here to represent the thermal noise I'm going to get. I drew it with a particular polarity, but remember the noise is random. So the actual voltage you measure over here, you don't actually know its polarity. So in fact, usually, and I'll do this in one second, usually when I draw a noisy voltage, I'll kind of indicate it like this. Because again, the point is I don't really know what that value is, so this is intended to indicate that's a noisy voltage source. Okay? So now, this is my model for a resistor with some thermal noise in it. And so what we want to know now is how do I come up with essentially what value I should use from a, I should say, really from a variance standpoint to represent that voltage source. Okay? And so remember, power is directly related to variance. You know, by, uh, how many of you guys have at least taken some sort of statistics before? Anybody? Any kind of statistics at all? Okay, everybody knows what variance is, at least from your, from your midterms or whatever, right? Okay, so with random variables, the more variance it has, the more, quote unquote, power there is in that signal. Because you can kind of think about it, if I have some random thing, the bigger the variance is, the bigger the peak-to-peak -peak stuff that I'm putting into it is, right? So when I say variance and power, those are somewhat interchangeable here. Okay, and again, that's, that's kind of intuitively you should be able to think of that as if I have a really small signal and I have a lot of noise, the, the magnitude of that variation is going to be big in comparison to the signal. So we say sort of the power of that noise is large. Okay, so now I know that the power that I have available to me we already said before, that's kT delta F. So now all we need to do is figure out what variance of voltage should I apply to this noisy voltage source to make it so that I actually deliver that amount of power to this fake load that I've put at the output. That fake load there, that's the so-called matched load. I put that matched load there just to be able to extract the maximum amount of power out of this voltage source as I possibly could. Okay. So in order to do that, it's actually pretty easy, because clearly the voltage over there is just going to be Vn over 2, right? Because it's just a simple resistive divider. So that's the voltage I have there. Who remembers what power dissipated in a resistor is as a function of voltage, of course? Way back from, you know, ancient years, somebody told you that thing. V squared over R. There we go, V squared over R, right? And by the way, that's just, of course, V times I, where I is V over R. Okay, so if the power is V squared over R, 
That means that I can say that the power delivered to this fake load over here is Vn squared, my noisy voltage source's variance, divided by 4R. Okay? So actually, just by using that, since I know that this has to be the case, and I know that this also has to be the case, I can equate the two and very quickly figure out what's the variance I should use for this noisy voltage source in order to get that amount of power into the matched load. Okay, so by the way, if you've ever seen anything at all related to noise, you've probably seen an equation that looks something like this. So with the resistors, the noise voltage variance is just 4 KTR delta F, okay? Now, by the way, this is something I was kind of hinting at maybe a little bit earlier, but notice a lot of these things, you actually have absolutely no control over whatsoever, right? KB, that's just physics. That's Boltzmann's constant. So nothing you can do about that from a circuit design standpoint, right? Temperature, well, okay, maybe you could argue that somebody could do something about it, but most of the time that's outside of your control because right, you probably want to build a circuit that will work just fine in Alaska and you know here in California, right? or even worse in the Mojave Desert or whatever it is. Okay, So temperature, again, you usually don't have too much control over. Resistance, maybe you have a little bit of control, but remember, the actual amount of power you're getting from the noise is always the same. right? So okay, well, we might be able to play some games there, but not a whole lot. And then bandwidth. Again, there's maybe a little bit of a game you can play, but usually, depending upon what you're, tr what you're trying to do, that may, again, be specified. Okay? So the key kind of trick here is that a lot of this stuff, you know, it, it seems like it's fairly sort of simple expressions. And that's kind of true because it's just it's so fundamental that in many cases, there isn't actually much you can do to directly modify the things you're interested in. Now. That's not to say that you as a designer can't do a good job to minimize noise. That's why we're kind of going through all this. But notice that a lot of the stuff we're talking about really is just kind of fundamental. Okay. So we've already figured out if I wanted to model thermal noise in a resistance, I would do that as an example the way I just did, which was, again, I put a noisy voltage source in series with a resistor. And the variance of that noisy voltage source would just be 4 KTR this B here, by the way, is just equivalent to delta F. Again, that's the bandwidth. Okay, we'll come back to what I mean by that in a second. I could also model it in, it actually turns out to be exactly equivalent. You can imagine just from a Thevenin and a Norton standpoint, that should be clear. I can also model the noise with a current source in parallel with the resistance. And if I do it that way for much the same arguing or much the same reasoning that we used a second ago, the noise current variance is just going to be 4 kT B, again, the bandwidth, divided by R. Okay? So in voltage, it's times R. In current, it's divided by R. Or as, as sometimes people will write it, and actually we'll be using that fairly often, this is actually just 4 kT delta F times G, the conductance of the resistor. Okay? So... There's one other sort of interesting thing to note. Uh, you know, I'm going to maybe walk through a little more details here, again, just to make sure everything is clear. But it's actually kind of one interesting thing to notice or, or to realize, because we'll use this again in a second. So I've talked about noise and resistors. And you might expect that you know, soon I would talk about noise and other elements. But just to maybe prefetch a little bit, it turns out the only things that generate noise are things that actually dissipate energy. Okay, so you know again, if you're a physics kind of person, you like physics, you can go and like there's things there's you can read books about what's the so-called fluctuation dissipation theorem. Fancy way of saying that the only things that generate noise are things that actually dissipate energy. Okay, and we'll see sort of an example of why that has to be in a second. But notice here, I've talked about resistors. Basically, it has to be something that dissipates energy to actually get any noise out of it. Okay. So just a couple other sort of things to note here on the models, just because it'll be a little bit different than some of the active devices we'll look at in a second. The noise has nothing to do with how much current or voltage you put on the resistor. Okay, so the noise is always the same. So no matter how much current or voltage you, you add in or you take away, noise is always the same. Okay? There's other types of noise that are different than this, but thermal noise, that's always the same. 
Again, the other thing is just as a reminder, even though I drew a voltage source and a current source here, they're totally random. Okay, so that's why I kind of did this swirly thing on the voltage. On the current, I just indicated that by rather than having one arrow, I put two. Okay, it's just saying it's random, you don't really know what it is. So the only things you can do, are, or the only questions you can answer, are things like the following. You can say, okay, well, if I took a voltmeter and measured the, volt, the voltage across here, I can't tell you instantaneously what the value should be, but I can do something like just over time, basically collect each time I sample it, keep track of what that value was, and then plot how many times did I get a certain value over a certain number of measurements. In other words, what I can basically tell you is what's the distribution of that voltage. Okay, And if you do that, as I sort of noted on the slide there, what you'd get is a Gaussian distribution. Okay, So if this is the probability of getting a certain noise voltage, and that's the noise voltage, you'd get, and obviously my Gaussian isn't the best looking Gaussian in the world, but pretend that that's really what it is. Basically, you're going to get a Gaussian distribution. Okay. Now, by the way, the other thing that's sort of important to note is the mean of that Gaussian distribution is zero. By the way, why is it not surprising that the mean of that thing is zero? Like, what would really bother you if the mean was not zero? What do you guys think? Let's say the mean was, I don't know, a volt or 10 microvolts or whatever it is. Why would that bother you? Generate power. Say that again? Generate power. Yeah, it's kind of like you're generating DC power out of nothing, right? Because you have this sort of DC voltage sitting there, and somehow, you know, magically, DC current's coming out of it. Doesn't sound too, uh, too right. Uh, now, by the way, there are actually things that sort of look like they're noise, which not exactly do that, but kind of, you know, if you measured it for the, only a certain amount of time, would look like they're doing it. But yeah, that's exactly the point. In reality, statistically speaking, if you repeated the experiment many, many times, it should indeed be zero mean, just kind of by definition, right? Because if it's things randomly moving around, there's no particular reason why they should be sitting there biased at one direction, OK? Now, the other thing that I had mentioned, which was kind of implicit in the previous slides, is thermal noise is essentially white. And what I mean by white, this is, I don't know why they came up with these analogies. That's sort of in the analogy of spectrum as it relates to uh, colors. So like different colors have basically different profiles in the frequency space. So white really just means that if I look at essentially how much noise power I have at each given frequency bin, and I look at that versus frequency, white noise means that it's flat. Okay. In other words, the noise is distributed equally over all frequencies. Another way of saying that, by the way, in the time domain just means that at any individual instant of time that I look at it, I'm going to get a completely new value of the noise. So it doesn't matter what the noise was previously. At any given point in time, I'm going to get a slightly different value, or I can get actually a very different value. It doesn't matter what the previous thing actually was. Okay. We're going to see in a second that there's going to be other things I can introduce that will make it not white. So as an example, I could have things that might have only a low pass nature. That generally doesn't change the distribution. It just changes how quickly, basically, the noise can move around. Okay? Does this kind of make sense to people? Or? Is it really measurable, that Gaussian distribution? Yeah, Cause absolutely. Because you said you, you can't see instantaneous so I couldn't so the thing I can't do is predict the instantaneous value so if you asked me you know here's this circuit what's the instantaneous value of that noise voltage that I can't tell you but okay, I you can, can measure it okay. right so I can take a voltmeter and I can just try and measure what that thing is and over time collect samples of that okay. right that I can do I just uh, I guess the point I'm making is that Unlike if I just gave you something like this, where this is, let's say, 1 volt, and that's 50 ohms, and that's 200 ohms, you would say, OK, the voltage there should be whatever, points blah, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 volts, or something like that. right? Here, I can't do that. All I can tell you is, OK, the variance at that point would be whatever, 50 over 250, so 
actually, no, sorry, 200 over 250 times the variance of the input. Okay? Does that kind of make sense? Or? Yeah. Okay. Now, just to sort of clean up one minor loose end here, um, I've claimed that the noise is white. It turns out it's not exactly white. It actually sort of has some shape to it up at higher frequencies. Um, that's, if, by the way, if you're curious, that's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. Again, bunch of physics, probably not too important. The good news is, from our standpoint, none of that stuff happens until you're way up in the terahertz frequency range. So at least for any sort of reasonable semiconductor device that I know of, you ain't going to be getting anywhere close to there anyway, so don't worry about it. Just, it's basically white. Okay? So again, just to sort of give you some example numbers that are kind of useful to keep in the back of your head. If I have a 1 kilo ohm resistance, and I have a 1 megahertz bandwidth, the variance of, of the noise, which, by the way, I'll use sigma many times to indicate the standard deviation. So the variance is sigma squared. Sigma is the standard deviation. So the standard deviation of the noise you'd get would be 4 microvolts. Okay. Now, again, just to sort of make sure it's clear, there's usually some sort of confusion with the units here, because when you talk about the noise being distributed over frequency, it's the noise power or the noise variance that's distributed over frequency. So usually the numbers you get, if you want to look at, let's say, in voltage rather than in volts squared, you get these kind of funny units like for a 1 kilo ohm resistor, you have 4 nanovolts per square root of hertz. And that square root just comes because it's actually the units of, you know, this over here is volts squared per hertz. Okay? So the power goes up linearly with frequency. The voltage, or the standard deviation, only goes up with the square root of frequency. Okay? Does this make sense to everybody? Or? Okay, good. So now, I kind of touched on this a little bit before. So I said earlier that kind of there was only noise in things that dissipate power. So what does that mean about if I have, let's say, a capacitor in my circuit? Is that capacitor going to have any noise associated with it or no? What do you guys think? So who thinks capacitors should have thermal noise? In other words, generate thermal noise. One brave soul. Two brave souls? Three brave souls? OK. Who thinks it shouldn't? Nobody. OK. So somebody, th oh, maybe one person. OK. So somebody who thinks it does, why do you think it does have noise? Yeah, the, why do you think? It's like a dielectric, so it's. OK, what does that dielectric do? So there are atoms or electrons moving around randomly, so there should be some uh, OK. Well, so now we have to be a little bit tricky. Let's maybe see why, you know, why else? Somebody else who thought that there is noise, why? Because there's parasitics. Oh, OK. So that's what I thought somebody was going to say. So you're just saying, OK, fine. You said you have a capacitor. In reality, that capacitor has some resistance associated with it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. But I actually, you know, I'm really asking, when I draw this circuit element right here, does that have any noise associated with it? In other words, does that generate any thermal noise? No. It doesn't. So, you know, the one other brave soul who said it doesn't, they got it right. Okay? Because, you know, so I can kind of call in the physics. The physics says, you know, only if you dissipate energy can you actually have thermal noise. Let's actually sort of walk through a simple, maybe somewhat intuitive explanation to see why that is. Okay? So, the key thing to remember that is, if you have thermal noise, it's not that you're really generating power. That's just, it's just sort of a consequence of the fact that things are moving around randomly. So as an example, if I had two resistors that I placed in parallel, if I was to kind of draw the noise model for both of those things, right? So I'd have, let's say, Vn1 squared and Vn2 squared. So if I was to do that, if you walk through this circuit, what you'll see is that whatever power this resistor is delivering to the other one, exactly the reverse will happen. In other words, on the net, there's no power really being generated or flowing in the circuit, which kind of makes sense, right? Because literally all this is is just two resistors 
tied up in parallel. So there better not be any power generated net in this system. Right? In other words, the system should be at equilibrium. Okay? So now let's see what would happen if we tried with a capacitor. Okay, so first let's say just say we have the resistor, it's got its noisy voltage, and then I've got my capacitor, right? Okay, so this noise voltage over here, can the capacitor dissipate any energy? No, right? Cap can't dissipate any energy. All it can do is store it. So what that basically means is sort of, you know, I may be storing energy occasionally on that cap, but every time I store it, it's just going to be sort of sent back over to the resistor occasionally, right? So over here, I should basically have zero net energy being generated. Let's try the other direction. Let's say that I had that capacitor. Let's say the capacitor had a noisy voltage associated with it. So now, what's the problem that's going to happen here? Why do we have an issue? Again, let's say that capacitor is just generating some thermal noise voltage. What's the resistor going to do to that power? Speak up. Consume power. Yeah, it's just going to dissipate that power, right? It's going to turn it into heat. So in fact, if somehow that capacitor was magically generating a noisy voltage, the resistor would just dissipate that thing as heat, and the whole thing just heats up, right? Hmm, something's a little bit wrong here, because where the heck did that energy come from? Right? The capacitor, it's just, it, it's just a capacitor. It can't magically generate energy. But somehow in this circuit, I've now, you know, I've said that if I had a noisy voltage in the capacitor, I would actually be dissipating energy in the resistor. And there's no reverse process to actually dissipate the same amount of energy in the capacitor, because the capacitor doesn't dissipate energy. Okay? So again, this is kind of a little bit hand-wavy, intuitive way of thinking about things, but that's really sort of what it comes down to. And that's really the reason why... Say that again? What about that one? First one, it also dissipates energy. Ah, but so here's the trick. Right? In this first thing, you're, you're talking about here, or you're talking about over... Oh, yeah, left. So, two. Uh, one. One, okay. Uh -huh. So, the trick here is, notice, whatever uh -huh. energy I've delivered to this resistor, whatever power I'm delivering to that resistor, it's delivering the same thing back. Right? So, if I look at the whole circuit, it's in equilibrium. Right? It's not that I have a net power being delivered only to one side and not being dissipated back on the other. Do you see what I mean? Or, okay. Right? So the trick here is that, again, the amount of power that, you know, if I just broke the circuit, let's say, this way, and I ignored this noise, and I saw how much power was flowing into that, and then if I did the reverse thing, so I just said, okay, how much power is coming out of the resistor on the right? You'd see that it's exactly the same. Okay? And in fact, by the way, in case you're curious, this does mean that if you have two resistors at different temperatures and you just tied a metal wire or a conductive wire between them, <clears throat> even if that wire had no thermal conductance, the two things would have to go into thermal equilibrium. So they'd have to go to the same temperature. Just because, or at least without you doing some other pumping or whatever it is. Just because otherwise then there, the thermal noise that would be dissipating on each other is not balanced. And so, in order to bring that into balance, they have to basically up, you know, one side, whichever side is cooler, would have to sort of bring up to be matched with the other side. Okay? Does that kind of make sense to everybody? Or? Okay, so again, really the, the key trick here is that in order to enable sort of you to actually sit in some sort of equilibrium, for you to generate noise, you also have to be able, or at least thermal noise, you also have to be able to dissipate things and translate basically from, let's say, voltage or current into heat. Okay? So, any kind of questions on this? I know it's sort of a little bit, maybe not esoteric, but a little bit strange point of view on things. Okay, so now just to be sure it's absolutely you know, clear, so if I put an inductor into the circuit, is that inductor going to have any noise associated with it? 
No, right? If I put a transformer into the circuit, is the transformer going to have any noise? No, right? So basically for any kind of passive circuit, the only thing that's going to be generating noise is whatever the real part of that impedance. In other words, whatever the resistance associated with that circuit is, that's really what's going to be generating the thermal noise. Okay? Okay, so now there is one thing that, or actually a couple more things that we need to deal with before we kind of move on to talk about other types of elements and their noise. And that's how we're going to do sort of calculations with noise. So we're going to see this in more detail probably by the end of today, and if not, you know, certainly by next time. So when we do calculations with noise, there's kind of a couple of, or actually really three things that we have to really keep in mind. So the first is, and this is sort of obvious and should be clear from your original circuit intuition, if I look at the instantaneous voltages, meaning if I took like a voltmeter and I took it across two noisy things, the instantaneous voltages would add. Okay? That's definitely true. If I looked at the power spectral density, meaning the Vn squared over delta F, those would also add. What does not add, however, is the variance, the standard deviations. Okay? So just to be really clear, let's just kind of go through an example to see what I mean by that. So let's say I have a resistor R1 that, of course, I can model with some noisy voltage, another resistor R2 that, again, I can model with some noisy voltage. Okay? That's Vn1 squared. That's Vn2 squared. Okay? So what's the value of the variance for each one of those resistors? What's Vn1 squared? What's that going to be? This is that you know, famous thing that I said, if you've ever looked at noise, you should you know, keep this one in mind because you're going to see it a bunch of times. So flip back a couple pages if you need to. So what is that? 4 kt by R1. Yeah, it's just 4 kt R1 times delta F. Okay, how about the bottom one? 4 kt R2. Yeah, 4 kt R2 delta F, right? Okay, so now... If I was to take a voltmeter and measure the voltage across there, and then ask, what's the variance, or what's the sigma squared of the voltage out there? And let's call that Vn total squared. What should that be? V1 squared plus Vn2 squared. Yeah, it's going to be Vn1 squared plus Vn2 squared, okay? Now, so why did I make a big deal out of this? Because usually when people first look at this, they say, well, hey, Vn total is equal to Vn1 plus Vn2. Well, instantaneously that's true, but remember we're working with random variables here. So if you're interested in the variance, you always have to add things in variance, okay? And just in case you didn't believe me, those two resistors in series are, of course, totally equivalent to just one res resistor with the sum of the resistance. And the variance for this, let's call that Vn3 squared, would be 4 kT R1 plus R2 delta F, okay? And again, just, to think, just in case you think I'm making a big deal out of nothing, the errors you get if you don't add things in variances are really, really big. Right? So let's say that R1 and R2 are the same size. Well, if they're the same size, then this variance over here is going to be twice the each of the individual variances. But that means that the standard deviation, meaning the sigma of the voltage, is only square root of 2 times larger. Right? And you can imagine if I increased, you know, I made one of them like 10 times larger than the other one, and you just added the, the two together, the error you get in that addition would be even worse. Okay? So again, just don't make that mistake. Whenever you're dealing with noise, voltages, or currents for that matter, just remember that 
it's always the variances that add and not the, you know, if you have two independent sources, add the variances, not the instantaneous voltages, okay? Does this make sense to everybody here? Okay. So now, let's say that I do indeed give you some passive network. We'll actually walk through exactly this example in one second. But just as an example, let's say that I give you an RC circuit, okay, where the R and the C are tied up in parallel. And I've already taken a shortcut and added in some noisy voltage over there, okay? So I did say earlier that the capacitor doesn't have any noise associated with it, but it certainly does filter the noise coming from the resistors. In other words, it's going to change the frequency spectrum of what we would measure if we looked at this voltage out over here, okay? So now what we need to know is, well, how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to figure out what the total noise is if I look at that frequency spectrum out there? Well, I have this sort of slightly complicated equation over there. It turns out it's actually fairly simple. So this noise source over here we know is white, right? If I just removed that voltage there and I just did something like, and I told you I have a circuit that looks like this, where let's say that's V in and that's V out. What kind of circuit is that? Other than an RC circuit, of course. What does that circuit do? What's the relationship between V out and V in? Low pass filter? Yeah, it's a low pass filter, right? <coughs> so it turns out the way you would do the calculation is something like the following. Let's just say that V out over V in is equal to H of S, okay? The way you'd actually calculate how much noise is going to show up at V out is something like the following. Let's just plot H of S, really the magnitude of H of S squared, and really to be more precise, I should do the magnitude of H of J omega versus omega. Okay, in fact, to be really, really correct, I should do this versus frequency, and let's do that also versus frequency. So J 2 pi F. Okay? So if I do that, it's a low-pass filter, and you get something that sort of looks like this, right? Of course, maybe I did this in the, the log just to make my life easier. Okay, so what's the noise going to turn out to be? If I have a white noise at the input, what I'm basically doing is I'm say, taking something that's it's even, it's flat over all frequencies, right? And then I pass it through this low-pass filter. So if I want to know what the total noise at the output is, remember I said that you know I have to look at the bandwidth? Well, that's kind of like saying that, okay, if I want to know the total noise at the output, I take this little chunk, I figure out how much noise power is there. I take that little chunk, I figure out how much noise power is there, and so on and so forth. And I just add the total power in each one of those chunks up, okay? So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the area under that curve. That's essentially what's going to tell me what the total noise voltage at the output is, or the noise power, I should say, excuse me. Now, the only thing you have to be a little bit careful about is I didn't make a mistake here. This really is squared, okay? Because remember, we're looking at noise power not at noise voltage. So when you do these calculations, the noise voltage at the output is always essentially, it's really the integral of whatever that frequency shaping is, again with a squared there, times the white noise source that you're applying that shaping to. Okay? And the only reason there's a summation here is just I'm summing it over all the, the different uh, noise sources essentially. Okay, and all the different transfer functions. So we'll see an example, you know, specifically of how we do this, but keep this general thing in mind because, you know, very soon that's how we're going to really be doing all these different calculations here. Okay. Any questions on this, sir? So everybody can calculate noise in in circuits like right off the bat now, right? Okay, well, so we'll, we'll see how that is. We'll get to some examples shortly, and we'll see uh, you know, if you guys can really do it. <laughs>
So before we do that, let's just kind of walk through the rest of our circuit book in terms of things we're likely to run into. So we talked about resistors, obviously. We said resistors, they dissipate power so they can have thermal noise. Capacitors, inductors, transformers, not so much because they just store stuff. But certainly things like diodes, transistors, yeah, they can have noise in them. In fact, if we look at diodes, there's even a slightly different type of noise that we're going to run into. That noise is what's called shot noise. Okay? That shot noise actually in many ways looks very similar to thermal noise. So it's still going to be zero mean for reasons that we kind of already talked about. The distribution or the uh, probability density function or PDF, that's also going to be Gaussian. It's also going to be white. But now, rather than it being set only by temperature, it's actually set only by the amount of current flowing through that particular element, which in this case will be a diode. Okay? So for shot noise, the noise current density is 2 times Q, which is the electronic charge, times the DC current you have flowing through it, times the bandwidth you're interested in. Okay? So now, by the way, anybody, anybody ever heard of shot noise before? Or? Couple people. So, anybody happen to remember or happen to have heard where does shot noise actually come from? Like, what's the sort of physical source? Poisson. Say that again. Poisson process. Uh, yeah, it is a Poisson process, but I want you know, I, I'm I'm talking like really simplistically here. Like, w what's going on? What causes shot noise? Electrons over a barrier. There we go. So it's basically electrons hopping over a barrier, right? So like in a diode, where you have electrons sort of hopping over the band gap or whatever the residual gap is, that's where shot noise comes from. Okay? So given that that's the case, why does it sort of make sense that Q pops up in this equation here? What is Q, by the way? Just to remind everybody. I don't mean the value, I just mean what is it associated with? Electron charge. Yeah, it's the electron charge, right? So it kind of makes sense that the electron charge shows up in this thing, because if the whole source of this noise was electrons hopping over a barrier, it makes sense that the more charge I have for each one of those electrons, the more sort of noise I would get each time one of them hops over that barrier, right? So that's kind of why that shows up there. So again, just to give you some sort of rough examples, if let's say I had one milliamp flowing through my diode, then the shot noise I would get is 17.9 picoamps per square root hertz. And again, that's in standard deviation. Or to say that another way, over 1 megahertz bandwidth, I would get 17.9 nanoamps of sigma in variation in the current. Okay. Now, when I said this is actually very similar to thermal noise, there's, there's again, a whole bunch of like theoretical papers people have written about this. But there's actually kind of an intuitive way to understand why there should be a direct relationship here. So to see that, let's pretend I did the following experiment. Okay. So let's say I gave you a diode, but I put it inside of like a black box. Okay. So you don't actually know that it's a diode inside of there. And then what I do is I tell you, okay, bias this thing with a certain amount of current. Measure the small signal resistance around that bias point. Okay, so let's say I have some current flowing through here. Let's call that ID. And I tell you, okay, measure the resistance at that bias point. And then, hey, if it's a resistor, it should have thermal noise, right? So based on that resistance, we could predict what we think the thermal noise should be, right? So let's just carry out that experiment. Let's say, they say indeed, there was a diode inside of there. Okay, so if I wanted to measure the incremental resistance of that diode, that's of course just DID DVD. And just like we talked about before for BJTs, that's going to turn out to just be the drain current divided by KT over Q, right? The thermal voltage. Okay, so I would claim that this is my incremental, it's not my incremental resistance, it's the incremental conductance, okay? So now, just as a, rem a reminder, if I had a resistor, what would be the, the variance of the noise current for a resistor? Or more precisely, for a conductance. So let's say I told you I have a conductance G. What is that 
variation there, or that noise variance. This is not a trick question, by the way. So if I have a conductor G, what's the, the noise current variance? It's already there. OK, yes, it is right there. But you know, it's 4 kT G delta F. OK? So now I'm just going to take that G diode and say, well, let's pretend that this thing was a resistor and see what noise variance am I predicting for the, for the current, OK? And if I do that, if I just plug in G diode over there to this thing, magically the KT cancels, the Q pops up at the top, the ID of course also cancels, uh, excuse me, the ID shows up over here, and notice what you get is that you'd predict that you got 4 QID. Interesting, right? Looks a heck of a lot like the shot noise I just said I'm supposed to get. So now, anybody have an idea why is it that even though it looks a heck of a lot like shot noise, it's off by exactly a factor of two? I'll give you guys a hint. For diodes, when I'm running current through them, or I guess I should say if I'm sort of looking at the IV characteristic, what's kind of different about a diode versus a resistor? Meaning, from the very first time you learned about diodes, what did people kind of tell you? Or in fact, even looking at the symbol, what is a diode kind of indicating? One directional current. Yeah, it's only, it's only got current flowing in one direction, right? That turns out to be exactly the reason, well, at least some people will claim this. Again, this is slightly debated, but I, I tend to agree. That's actually exactly the reason there's this factor of two difference here. Because if I've only got current flowing in one direction, if you think about it from a random event standpoint, the variance I get from stuff going in one direction is exactly half of the variance I would have gotten if I allowed things to flow in both directions. Because remember, if those two events are independent, I would add those two variances together, and my total variance would be the sum. right? Whereas here, because I'm only forcing it in one direction, half of the things that could have happened just went away. And so that's why there's this exactly factor of two difference between them. OK? Does that kind of make sense to people? or? So, so You're right. We're only looking at the small signal thing. So again, this is somewhat of a debated point. But you know, and I picked a particular example of like a diode. But actually, you know, the, the analogy or the intuition behind it makes a lot of sense. Right? So I'm not saying you should apply this blindly to every single source of shot noise you've ever found, because that may or may not hold. But Makes some sense here, right? OK. So now, since we know what noise in diodes is, in a BJT, I'll be a little bit mean as sort of a glorified diode in some sense, should be pretty easy for you to figure out what's the thermal noise for a BJT as well. OK, so if I just take the, the small signal model for the BJT, and I just keep track of which things are actually diodes, I can very quickly figure out what is the thermal noise model for the BJT. Okay? Now, there's a couple of sort of important points I need to make here. So the first is that obviously in any real device, there's always parasitics. As an example, there's always just parasitic resistance touching the leads of that device. That parasitic resistance is always going to have some thermal noise associated with it. Okay? So those three resistors and those three noise voltages I added there to the small signal model, that's just for the extrinsic parasitics. Okay. There's one other sort of very important point. Anytime you draw a small signal model and you add like you know the controlled voltage source and these R naught and for the BJT the R pi, even though we said it's resistors that generate noise, remember these resistors here are small signal resistors. They're not actual physical resistors. So there's no noise explicitly associated with those. Okay? The noise has to be associated with you know, the physical mechanism of how the device is actually operating. So in the case of the BJT, right, the base emitter, that's a diode. right? So I'm going to have some 
shot noise current associated with that diode. And that, I believe, is exactly what's written right there. Uh, don't worry about this term over here. We'll come back to it. Okay. So there's just some shot noise flowing through in the base because of the base current. Similarly, from the collector to the emitter, I also have almost essentially a diode. Right? I know it's a back-to-back -back stack and it's swept through. Bottom line, it's basically a diode. Okay. So just like I had some shot noise here, I also have some shot noise flowing basically from that collector to the emitter. And that's, again, what I've written right here. But key point to remember is if, when you draw the small signal model, don't just go and associate noise sources with those small signal parameters, because that won't actually be the right answer. So in other words, if you take a black box and you put some active devices inside of there, even if you measure the small signal resistance, the noise you get does not necessarily have to be 4 kT times that times the, that small signal resistance times delta F. Okay, it can be something else. And in fact, in some sense, that's why when we build active circuits, we can actually get effectively lower noise than obviously what we could have done if we just had purely passive circuits. Okay, does this make sense to everybody here? Okay, so. Obviously, what kind of device are we going to be most interested in from a noise standpoint? MOSFET, right? That's kind of our bread and butter, and so that's what we're going to be most interested in. Well, MOSFETs, unfortunately, are slightly more interesting to understand their noise characteristics because they just go through lots of different regions of operation. So I'm going to start out just kind of walking through each region and kind of intuitively arguing what the noise should be in that particular region. Well, so. The good news is, the, if I start out with the triode region, it should actually be very easy to convince you why I claim I know exactly what the noise is going to be. Okay? So let's just pretend I look at a triode MOSFET, meaning something operating deep in the linear region. And in particular, what I mean by that is, let's pretend that the VDS is actually 0 volts. But I've got some VGS applied to it. Okay. If I have that, then the channel charge profile just looks like this, right? I just track some charge up to the surface, and that's what the thing looks like. Well, guess what? When VDS is really, truly zero, or rather, I should say, very, very small, the damn thing just looks like a resistor, right? If it looks like a resistor, noise should be just like a resistor. Okay, and indeed, that's exactly what happens. So if I just call this GDS naught, the conductance of the MOSFET with zero VDS across it, which is, again, just you know basically the equation I wrote there. And of course, I'm assuming a long channel device there. But same thing basically holds, even if it's a short channel device, from the standpoint of looking at that conductance. Whatever that conductance is, the noise current I would get through this would just be 4 kT GDS naught delta F, because it really is just a resistor. Okay. So now, obviously, we have a little bit more fun, because triode, this was sort of the simplest case, because I really just made everything be a resistor. And so if I have a resistor, it should be really easy to predict what the noise is. Now, obviously, life is going to get more fun, because I most of the time, particularly in analog circuits, I'm going to be dealing with a saturation region of operation. But maybe, you know, maybe I'll throw this out there. If I'm going to do saturation, how do you think I could go about figuring out what the effective noise should end up being? What sort of a method you could use to do that? And obviously, I've given you the results here already, but you know, what method, just intuitively, do you think you would follow to try and get that channel noise, or to get that noise in the MOSFET. What do you guys think? Must have some idea. OK, you're saying, why don't we kind of treat it like a resistor? I buy that argument. So if I was going to treat it like a resistor, what's kind of the problem I run into with a saturated MOSFET? And let's maybe. I'll only draw the channel charge profile. 
right? So the channel charge, let's say, looks something like that. So you said, why don't we treat this thing as a resistor? I like that idea. What's the only problem with trying to treat it as a resistor? Bias dependent. Okay, um, you're right. It's kind of bias dependent. Let's assume I've done it for a fixed bias. Let's even you know, look more carefully at this channel charge profile that I drew here. What do you guys think? Can I really characterize this by kind of just one resistance? Asymmetric. So. OK, it's asymmetric A. And B, if I kind of, even if I was to cut this up into little chunks, there'd basically be different resistors in each one of those chunks, right? I'd start out with maybe a relatively small resistance, and as I got closer to the drain, it would get bigger and bigger, right? Well, turns out that method is actually kind of the right thing to do. You just say, okay, fine. The resistance isn't exactly constant, but I could break this thing up into little chunks, figure out what the contribution from each one of those little chunks is, and then on the net, I should be able to know what the sort of effective resistance is, or really the effective conductance is, from the standpoint of generating noise. Okay, so there's a guy named Van Der Zeel who exactly did this math. You're interested, go take a look. But bottom line, what you end up with is, just like before, the drain current noise just ends up being 4 kT. And by the way, this whole term over here, if you remember, if you look back sort of one slide, that's just GDS naught, okay? So usually the way people will sort of write this out is they'll say the drain current noise, uh, variance of course, is 4 kT times some factor, in this case 2 thirds, times GDS naught times delta F, okay? And so actually for the, you know, if I have really a truly long channel device, turns out that GDS naught is exactly GM. And so the way people usually write this is that the drain current noise variance is 4 kT gamma GM times delta F. Okay, so the bigger the GM you use, the more the drain current noise variance is going to be. Okay? Now, it turns out to really do this right for the MOSFET in all of the different regions of operation, you actually have to look at the real channel charge profile, okay? It's a big pain in the butt, uh, you know, well, maybe it's not so horrible. Uh, it usually doesn't add a whole lot of intuition when I've gone through it in the past, so I decided for this year I'm just gonna skip it. But, you know, if you're interested, you really wanna know exactly how, you know, things work and how the MOSFET knows which region of operation it's in so that it knows if its noise should be, you know, 4 kT gamma GM versus 4 kT GDS naught. Go and take a look at actually the Savitas book. It'll give you a whole, you know, long and very detailed explanation as to what exactly is going on. But bottom line, it just has to do with you look at the channel charge. The only other reason I'll mention it here is because it turns out obviously Spice or BSIM, they can't just wave their hands like we do, right? They need some fairly precise formulation. So the way they handle this is indeed by looking at the channel charge. And they calculate the noise based on that channel charge. Okay. Any questions on this, or? Okay. Now I mentioned that that, you know, this expression here technically is only precise for long channel devices, because only in a long channel device is GDS not exactly equal to GM. For short channel devices, what people generally do is they say, okay, well. Since GDS not is not exactly the same as GM, I'm just going to introduce an extra parameter. So what I'm basically going to say is something like GDS not is equal to let's say GM over alpha. Okay. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned over here a lot of times this factor of two thirds that shows up in the front, which again maybe intuitively kind of makes sense because we have this sort of triangular shape in the channel charge. Oftentimes, people just refer to that as gamma, okay? That's just sort of this relationship between the saturated current, saturated current noise, and the triode current noise, okay? So a lot of times, people just call that this gamma factor here.
So in order to deal with short channel stuff, what we basically do is we introduce one more parameter. Okay, that's this alpha over here. So if I had a perfectly long channel device, perfectly quadratic, this alpha would basically be one. Okay? And so the noise would just be four kT gamma gm delta f. Now, once you get to short channel device, or again, really high field, this alpha, it's kind of like capturing you know, how the, the relationship between GDS naught and GM kind of gets broken, or more specifically, how it gets broken from a noise standpoint. So for short channel devices, this alpha over here usually is a factor of like two to three times, or I should say really one over alpha is two to three times larger in noise. Okay. So from now on, what I'll usually do, just because I'm lazy, I won't write this whole thing out. I'll instead just say the noise is 4 kT gamma gm delta f. Just remember that from now on when I write this, that gamma there is not necessarily 2 thirds. Okay? In fact, most of the time, I'll just probably approximate it as 4 thirds. Okay? It's not precise, but it's a reasonable estimate in most short channel devices. And again, that's purely just because I'm lazy. In a lot of textbooks, you'll see it always as gamma over alpha. But from now on, I just, that's, you know, three extra characters or whatever that I don't want to write. I'll just write alpha. Okay, so now one last sort of things that I need to, to mention on MOSFETs is it turns out that because the charge can't show up at the channel instantly after you put the gate voltage there, there's actually some equivalent resistance in series with the gate, just due to that delay in the charge moving. And in fact, that equivalent resistance generates noise. Okay. The good news is, for most of the stuff that we're going to be talking about, which is not at really, really high frequencies, basically that so-called induced or intrinsic gate noise isn't going to be too big of a factor. So from now on, I'm basically going to ignore it. But you should know that it is actually there. And in particular, if you work on like RF circuits at reasonably high frequencies or that are really, really noise sensitive, you have to keep track of that gate noise. And if you took you know, either 142 or are planning to take 242, that's a topic that you know, you'll spend some time on. So again, I mentioned that just so you kind of know about it. Yeah? What is no base induced noise? So what is the base? Or what base are you referring to, I suppose? <laughs> BPJT. Well, so this is a MOSFET, right? Yeah, I mean, in, in for BJT, is there a... Similar? Yeah, no, for, for a BJT, if you remember over here, there's a base noise, right? That base noise is just the shot noise of the base emitter junction. In a MOSFET, right, I mean, if I draw even the small signal model, but even sort of large signal, actually, let's go maybe over here, I have a capacitor here, right? So, well, and actually this is now leading into what, something I was going to mention anyways. Ideally speaking, if I have that capacitor there, at least at DC, there should be no current flowing, right? So initially you'd think, okay, fine, if there's no current flowing, then, or, or rather, there's no like kind of resistance associated with that oxide there, so there should be no noise associated with it, right? Again, it turns out there actually is, simply because it takes time for the electrons to get up to the surface there to respond to the change in the voltage. But in fact, in modern devices, I could almost even claim that there is something a lot like a base noise. So by the way, who remembers what's, what's sort of happening in modern devices that I could claim there is actually some shot noise directly at the gate? Tunneling. Yeah, there's tunneling current, right? Tunneling is like exactly a great example of electrons hopping over a barrier. So even though there isn't really, you know, there used to not be base current, if you have gate leakage, you'll also get shot noise from that gate leakage. Again, not something we're going to deal with too much in this class, because for most of the frequency ranges we're talking about, that's not going to be too big of a component. But, you know, again, if you're really, really super noise sensitive, something you should keep in mind. Any questions on this, or? All right, so 
one last really quick thing. So let's say I operated a MOSFET in weak inversion, meaning with a low V star. You know, V star approaching, let's say, I don't know, 60 millivolts or so. What would the what would the noise start looking like? What would it be dominated by? Or what characteristics would it follow, I guess I should say. What do you guys think? I'm just going to take my MOSFET and put, you know, VGS, let's say, equal to VTH. So what does that thing look like now in terms of operation? Come on, speak up. What did we say, you know, where does the leakage current kind of come from in a MOSFET? Shot noise. Okay, well you said shot noise. I agree there's going to be shot noise, but but why? Where's the leakage coming from? Barrier going on. Is there leakage from gate drain capacitance or gate source capacitance? Um, uh, so when I say leakage, I mean really, from drain to you know, that DC bias current that flows <laughs> even when I put a really, really low voltage. Sub-threshold Yeah, it's sub-threshold, right? Mm. Where does that sub-threshold current come from? Drain to source? Uh, sorry, I, I mean like... What device is inside of the MOSFET that's hiding, that's BJ, causing that leakage? BJT. Yeah, there's a BJT, right? In subthreshold, this whole thing is basically equivalent to something like C aux, C depletion. This is my source. That's my drain. And I have that parasitic BJT there, right? Which again is just coming from, if I draw my trusty old side view, Right? It's just that NPN transistor. It's not a very good NPN transistor, but it's a, it's a BJT. Okay? So just like you had said a second ago, if this thing is operating in subthreshold so that it looks like a BJT, I should expect that the current I get, or really the noise current I get, is shot noise. Right? And it's no longer thermal noise. Okay? And in fact, I should also expect that now I have shot noise kind of from the quote-unquote channel to the source, right? So indeed, if you operate the MOSFET in subthreshold, rather than using that you know, MOSFET model that we drew before, you should take you know, this capacitive divider in the front and then bolt it on to the BJT model. Okay, and actually, I guess I didn't show the MOSFET model. Here's the MOSFET model, okay? So by the way, there should be no sort of surprises here. This small signal model is really just your standard MOSFET small signal model. The only thing I added was this noise current over here, which again, as a reminder, is 4 kT gamma gm, okay? Where again, that gamma is really gamma over alpha. Okay, so as I had mentioned, we're in this class. We're really going to ignore that intrinsic gate noise. It is actually there. Unfortunately, you know, if you have too old of a simulator, it actually doesn't even have that parameter at all. So BSIM3, which is maybe five to ten years old now, that actually does not have this gate noise in it. Uh, in fact, actually, it doesn't even directly include this alpha factor we talked about. If you have BSIM4, which is like maybe three, four years old, actually maybe a little bit more than that. That includes all this sort of weird short channel kind of stuff. Okay, so just if you get a new model or a new technology, take a look at what the model actually is. Make sure it's giving you the right noise characteristics. And in particular, if you go and do a sim of a MOSFET and you find out that the thermal noise is lower than 4 kT times 2 thirds times GM, or even at 4 kT 2 thirds GM, you should kind of say, hmm, something seems bogus here because there should be an extra factor there, okay? Okay, so any last questions before we sort of move on to cover the last uh, type of noise that we're going to deal with? Okay, <clears throat> so the last type of noise, which is actually in some sense the most mysterious noise, is what's called 1 over F noise, or flicker noise, or again, for some bizarre reason, because people like the bizarre reason, because people like the color analogy, it's also referred to as pink noise. Again, don't ask me why. So, what is this one over F noise? Turns out, if I look at a MOSFET, 
Now that's my, my metal, my oxide, let's say over here. Unfortunately, those oxides are never exactly perfect. Okay, there's always essentially little defects inside of those oxides. Those defects are known as traps sometimes. Okay? So over time, what eventually will happen is an electron will just hop and get stuck in that little trap there. Okay? So now if I have an electron stuck in that little trap. It's kind of like I've shifted the threshold voltage, right? Which is another way of saying that actually I'm going to have some current flowing at the output or, you know, current taken away from the output because of that little random electron jumping into the trap, okay? Well, if you kind of think about it, if things are really going to get stuck there, then what's essentially happening is over time, I'm going to add up more and more of these little electrons stuck in these traps, right? So if you think about that from a sort of frequency standpoint, that means then rather than the noise being white, I'm doing something like integrating this, you know, process of electrons jumping into that point. So if I'm doing that integration, if I look at the frequency profile, so this is again, let's say, IN squared versus frequency, what you're going to see is something that looks like this. Meaning, as I wait longer and longer, more and more of these electrons get accumulated. And so the variance I get in my noise is going to go up. Okay? So that, this is really why this thing is called 1 over f. Because if you look at this spectral density profile, and actually this should really be that over delta f, that shape is 1 over f there, okay? Now, the reason I say this is somewhat mysterious is you can imagine exactly how many traps you're going to have and exactly, you know, the rate at which things jump in and out of those traps is really highly process dependent, okay? So depending upon what process you have, what materials they're using, you know, the cleanliness of the surfaces and things like that, you can get very, very different 1 over f noise performance. So usually when you go into a new process, there's these parameters here that we'll use in one second that the fab should just sort of hand to you. And they say, okay, the 1 over f noise parameter for my process is blah for the NMOS and blah for the PMOS. Okay? But once they've told you that, the thing that basically tells you how much 1 over f noise you're going to get, which obviously you're going to add to that noise generator over here, is this equation that I kind of or boxed just now. So it's just that process parameter that you're given times the DC drain current divided by the channel length squared times the oxide capacitance, Okay, where that C ox is just epsilon ox over T ox. So just to kind of give you a little bit of intuition, the reason that C ox shows up is because obviously, as I change that oxide capacitance, that's going to change how much impact that one little electron that gets stuck has on the current at the output, right? This is an example. You know, if I have a really thin oxide, I have lots of charge at these surfaces anyways, and so that one little electron doesn't have that big of an effect, right? Similarly, if I look at the channel length here, I actually end up with a quadratic dependence for the following reason. So one, just if I make the channel length longer, then I'm basically averaging out the effect over more and more space, right? I'm averaging out all the different electrons that either came in or came out, right? So that's kind of one linear dependence there. The other one is just simply, again, as we had said before, sort of the transconductance goes down as I increase that length. Right? So just like with FT, this flicker noise variance depends quadratically on the length. Okay? Now, by the way, at this point, usually somebody sort of looks at this thing and says, well, wait a minute, what the heck's going on here? And in particular, what the heck happens when F goes to zero? So you guys tell me, what happens when F goes to zero? What happens to the noise current variance? 
blows up. To infinity. Yeah, okay. So one person said it goes up. That's certainly true. The other person <coughs> said what's mathematically correct, it goes to infinity. So why does this really bother you? Or why does it probably bother you, I guess I should say? Because there shouldn't be infinity. Okay, well, you know, maybe, well, so by the way, when you say there shouldn't be infinity, when we went to zero frequency, how long did we wait to get there? Infinite time. We waited infinite time, right? So um, you're right, you know, it's kind of annoying that there's infinity, uh, but in fact, it's not quite as bad as you might think. Because A, it really does mean you waited infinite time, and so eventually it just says that kind of nothing works. Well, okay, fine, you know, I'm okay with that. If it works <coughs> probably even 10 years later, let alone 10 billion years later, I'm okay with that, right? So the real trick here is that even though indeed it goes, it looks like it goes off to infinity at quote unquote DC, in reality, you're always using the circuit for some finite amount of time, right? You're not going to be running the thing for a billion years. You're going to run it for, let's say, a second, 10 seconds, a day, a week, a year maybe, right? But all of those give you finite quantities. And in fact, if we follow our previous procedure that we said, if we want to know like the total variance of the noise, then what you would do is you'd specify some bounds on frequency, meaning what's the lowest frequency? In other words, how long are you going to run the circuit? up to what's the highest frequency, meaning the bandwidth at which you're going to run this thing. Okay? And as you guys hopefully remember, if you do that integral, if you have something that has a 1 over x and you do the integral dx, you just get something that has a natural log inside of there. Okay? That's basically the final result. In fact, that's kind of really good news. Because not only do we have to keep in mind that we're only running the circuit for a certain period of time, but actually, because of this natural log, even if I go all the way from one second to one year, the change in the noise variance is not that big. And intuitively, it kind of makes sense, because remember, we're always adding up these spectral densities, which means how much power there is per unit bandwidth. Well, there's not very many hertz between one hertz and I don't even know what the unit of that is, but one over one year hertz, right? Because that entire bandwidth there is basically one hertz. Whereas if I go from one hertz to one megahertz, that's six orders of magnitude, right? That's a lot of hertz sitting there. So I mentioned this one over f because actually it's, you know, in some applications it's really quite critical, especially in things that are, you know, very, very precise and relatively low frequency. So in fact, even things like, you know, let's say microphones or gyroscopes, 1 over f turns out to be actually a fairly dominant noise factor there. But in a lot of the things that we're going to talk about, which are more broadband, that 1 over f noise is not going to be too big of, a, of an impact on us. And in fact, towards the end of the class, we'll talk about some techniques we can use to even get around, you know, completely eliminate that 1 over f noise. Okay? But again, if you're looking at some fairly low frequency stuff, you really have to worry about that. So just to sort of wrap up on that, a lot of times with 1 over f noise, and specifically with MOSFETs, or actually with devices in general, the way people sort of characterize how big of a deal that actually is, is look at the so-called 1 over f noise corner. And where that comes about is something like the following. right? So if I have my MOSFET, Well, we said that if I look at the noise current, I'm going to have the part that comes from the thermal noise. All right, that's just that channel noise that we talked about. Plus, I'm going to have another noise source coming from that 1 over f stuff, which is the electrons getting trapped you know, in the oxide. Okay. So, of course, on the net, the total noise current I'm going to have, or the total noise variance, I should say, is the sum of those two. So now if I just draw a plot versus frequency of the total noise current variance, or the total noise current density versus frequency. So one of them we said is just white. That's the thermal noise. The other one we said is 1 over f. So if I look at the total, I get, of course, something that basically does that. right? 
So in order to kind of give you an idea of what frequencies is it where thermal, excuse me, 1 over F noise is really more important than thermal, it's kind of clear that what you're interested in is that corner frequency, right? Because for anything beyond that corner frequency, the noise is going to be totally dominated by the thermal noise. But as you go below that corner frequency, that's where the 1 over F is really going to be a lot more important than the thermal. Okay? So good sort of numbers to remember. Actually, unfortunately, these are a little bit old. Used to be that, you know, back in the sort of long channel days, and remember channel length matters a lot because of that term right there. Back in the long channel days, the 1 over F corner was fairly commonly somewhere between like maybe about 10 to 100 kilohertz, maybe up to about a megahertz or so. Okay, so pretty far down, you know, well into kind of the audio band of things. Uh, these days, if you work with like, I don't know, a 45 nanometer transistor, um, I've seen things with one gigahertz, one over F corners. Okay, so, you know, in some cases you have to worry about it a heck of a lot more than you used to. The quote unquote good news is that oftentimes if you're working with a more advanced technology, you're also probably going a lot faster. And so relatively speaking, the fact that 1 over F corner is larger than it used to be as a percentage of your overall bandwidth may not be that big of a deal. Okay? Does this kind of make sense to everybody? Or? Okay, so that's actually most of what I had from a noise standpoint. Uh, we'll maybe pick this back up when we come back next time, but take a look at these. These are kind of a reminder of just how you're actually going to do some of these noise calculations. And we'll do this a whole lot more when we get back from ISSEC. So see you guys all in about a week and a half.